is now my pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, chosen by our students. Charles Wudan is an award-winning journalist, best-selling author, and successful business executive. She was the first Asian American reporter to win a Pulitzer Prize. Ms. Wudan won the Pulitzer Prize with her husband, Nicholas Kristof, in 1990 for their coverage of China. She and her husband have co-authored four best-selling books, including two about Asia, Thunder from the East, and China Wakes. They are also the authors of Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide, which was turned into a powerful documentary film. More recently, Wu Dan and Kristoff received the Dayton Literary Pri Peace Prize's Lifetime Achievement Award. In addition, she was a senior lecturer at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs in 2011, where she taught about the challenges facing China. Ms. Wudan has won other journalism prizes, including the George Polk Award and Overseas Press Club Awards. Her work has been recognized widely, including a White House Project Epic Award, the Asia Women in Business Corporate Leadership Award, the Pearl S. Buck Woman of the Year Award, and the Harriet Beecher Stowe Prize for Writing for Social Justice. In 2011, Newsweek cited Wu Dun as one of the 150 women who shake the world. In 2012, she was selected as one of 60 notable members of the League of Extraordinary Women by Fast Company Magazine. Cheryl Wu Dun earned her BA from Cornell University, an MPA from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School, and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Since 2014, she has been an alumni trustee to Princeton University's Board of Trustees, and she previously served as a member of the Board of Trustees of Cornell University. Please join me in welcoming Cheryl Wu Dun as our 2016 commencement speaker. President LeBron, members of the Board of Trustees, thank you for this incredible honor to speak today um, here at Rice. Actually, President LeBron brought me here in a police car um, where I sat behind the greats. Uh, so I feel no pressure to say something nice about Rice. <laughs> I do have it on good authority, though, that Rice is the best known university in Texas, right? <laughs> President LeBron did not tell me to say that. But faculty, administrators, teaching assistants, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, sisters and brothers who have all helped your graduates in some way get to this day. Congratulations. And graduating students, in a few moments, you will all transform from real owls into real people. Many of you have ambitious plans for the future and you will join a very distinguished group of Rice University alumni. Some of you will do consulting work or sales and marketing. Some of you will go to medical school. Some of you may start a company, and maybe some of you already have. A few of you designed Parkit, an app that uses sensors and security cameras to find parking spaces. Another group of you developed a personal trainer to analyze body language, facial expressions, and voice control to help people prepare for public speaking. I would have used that this past week. Some of you will join Teach for America. Others will join a nonprofit or go to law school. Yes, I know, you are yearning to go and get started. I have a couple of messages for you all as you sally forth into this great, wild world, but I'd like to open with a few words from a great master who unfortunately couldn't be with here, couldn't be here with us today, Rudyard Kipling. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two imposters just the same. 
If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. You'll be a woman, my girl. You'll be a man, my son. Man, woman, grown up, wait. Isn't this all moving too fast? For some of you, you may feel like I'd like to turn back into a real owl, just for a moment. Well, take that moment now. Stop and smell the roses. Well, we're at Rice, the owl's nest. Still, do this now while you can. If only we can turn back time, what would we do differently? I know it's customary to tell graduates about how you're all going to have these great opportunities and climb the highest mountains and, will, and win Nobel Prizes. You'll have happy families and brilliant kids and so on. And some of you will. But in truth, can you really have it all? Isn't it glib to pretend that you can? One of the great challenges ahead will be the important decisions you will make in life. Most will involve trade-offs you will face. So we have to get our priorities right and figure out what we care most about. Trade-offs will come in all shapes and sizes, and often they will sneak up on you. Some will be small. I work the weekend, and it will get me a promotion. Some will be larger. I move overseas for a job, a great job, but I leave family and friends behind. Or harder, do you fire a good friend to save your company? Some will test your mettle. I'd like to see how you would have handled the challenge that my husband and I encountered when we first arrived in China. I had met a very smart, intelligent Chinese. We shall call him Hongjun. He wore glasses on his round face. He was beginning to bald and he was thin. We had become friends, and then over the years, Hong Jun left his job, but still talked about the future of China and its hope for reform. This was before China's economy became the second largest in the world. We had a mutual friend who had been put in prison. And so one day, my husband and I were speaking with Hong Jun, and we asked gently about this mutual friend. Hong Jun's ears perked up. And he said, did you know him well? Did you see him often? His inquisition put me on guard. He pressed on. He was a classmate of, off he was a classmate of mine, but, but how often did you see him? Not often, I lied. A week later, another friend pulled us aside and told us that Hong Jun was a spy for Chinese state security. That's like the CIA. Don't trust him with any information, she said. He's been asking about a book that you are writing. Well, we hadn't told anybody about our book. Only someone tapping our phones would have known about it. Then a few months later, Hong Jun asked us to write a recommendation for a prestigious fellowship at an American university. Not Rice, I'll have you know. Here's the dilemma. If we refused, Hong Jun might then figure out that our mutual friend had tattled on him being a spy. Our friend would get in trouble. Yet should we really help send a Chinese spy to America? We were in China. Our email, our mail, and our phones were tapped. So we couldn't tell the university the truth without perhaps getting caught. What would you have done? So how many of you would have written a recommendation, raise your hand? Oh. How many of you would not have written, written a recommendation, raise your hand? OK. Well, professors, how well do you know your students? Well, we wrote a letter that was so bland that we hoped it would 
warn the recipient off. But somehow we didn't think that that was enough. Next time, when we were in a place where we knew our phones were not tapped, in other words, not in China, we called the university and explained that while Hong Jun was a really nice guy and a smart guy, he was also a spy with China's CIA. Not surprisingly, he didn't get the fellowship. And we betrayed someone we, consider, we considered a friend. It doesn't sit well with me still after all these years. We consoled ourselves with the idea that we didn't help send a Chinese spy into the US. But here's another layer. Hong Jun wasn't very happy in his role. He knew he was doubted all the time by his friends. Sure, there were perks from the job, nice pay, good treatment, but going abroad could have been a way for him to start to break free from the shackles of China's state security. In other words, he didn't like being a spy. Maybe he, if he had gone to the US, he would have left spying. Maybe he would have spied for the US, who knows? There are many important decisions, many trade-offs ahead of you. You will find yourself in all sorts of impossible situations, loaded with uncertainty, where there is no right answer. And there is no education that will properly prepare you for these moments. But you do have a toolkit. You are educated. You are plugged into a social network of friends and family. You can think. You can write, you have goals. Your education doesn't give you answers because there aren't any to these kinds of questions. It's been said that education isn't about filling a bucket with knowledge. It's about lighting a fire. And that fire will inspire you and illuminate your path as you would navigate impossible choices we cannot even imagine today. And here's what I want to suggest, that in navigating these trade-offs, you make empathy one of your priorities. That is, thinking of others, getting into their heads, their struggles, and maybe even helping them. Empathy is multifaceted. It has practical uses. In negotiations, it is useful to understand the other side so that you know how to negotiate successfully with them. With customers, you need to understand what they need, what they want. It doesn't mean that when you deal with matters of the heart, like empathy, that you should neglect your head either. By all means, keep that on. This is not a recipe for being exploited. The world is becoming a much better place. We've seen amazing progress during even your young lifetimes so far. Less poverty, less child and maternal mortality, more widespread education, less violence. But there is still injustice, unfairness, brutality. Don't forget to lend your ear, your mind, your empathy, your resources to the less lucky in this world. We know them. They are the refugees, the war, veter war veterans suffering from injury, the rural poor who are being left behind in America and around the rest of the world. Those who are discriminated against because of their race, whether it's African Americans, Latinos, other minorities, or because of their gender. They are the marginalized, like the transgender, the sex trafficked women, foster children, poor children, even the poorly educated, middle-aged, white American whose mortality rates, believe it or not, are actually rising. Their world has been upended. They have no skills anymore for this new world. You can find empathy in big, in, in big ways and small ways. I'm reminded of a story from the Dominican Republic. There are some people who are raised in an environment where empathy is natural to them. It's a story of an aid worker who was working in the Dominican Republic with Habitat for Humanity. He had befriended a small boy named Aitin. He noticed that when Aitin, uh, when he saw Aitin, um, when he wore a shirt, Aitin wore a shirt, 
It was always the same dirty, tattered shirt. A box of used clothes had been left at the camp, and the worker found two shirts in it that were in reasonably good shape, in about a tin's size. So he gave them to the grateful boy. A few days later, the aid worker saw another boy wearing one of the shirts. When the aid worker next met up with Aitin, he said that he explained that the shirts were meant for him, Aitin. Aitin just looked at him and said, but you gave me two shirts. You are all ambitious, highly talented, highly trained, clever, and articulate individuals. You will rise high in your field. Some of you may invent something. Some of you may lead something. Some of you may change something. Some of you may make a lot of something. But remember that luck has played a role and will play a big role in your life too. You all are in the lucky half. I hope you see that with your accompli accomplishments and success comes some responsibility, which is in turn channeled by the empathy. Of course, you succeeded because of your hard work, your strong values, your determination, your grit, yes, indeed. But you also succeeded because your parents read to you when you were children. They gave you food and a nice home. If you'd been born in a Bangladeshi village, you probably wouldn't be a graduate here today. If you were born in certain zip codes, even here in the United States, you probably wouldn't be a graduate here today. It's an important day to be proud, but many factors lead to success. We don't control all of them, and they are not equally distributed in life. So for those of us who are lucky enough to be here, perhaps we can in the future try to help spread some of those opportunities to those who are less lucky. One of the great things about empathy, about thinking of others, is not that it not only will make others happy, but it also will make yourself happy. It will make you happy not just in the way that you have a fun time at party. I mean the deep satisfaction you feel in life and the sense of well-being that you feel on a typical day. We are learning more about what makes people happy. Once we make enough money to fulfill our material needs, earning more money or acquiring more things doesn't necessarily bring us more happiness. At that point, happiness is more about your in interactions with others and how you help those who need it. That's where empathy comes in and becomes altruism. Ah, you think that empathy, altruism, it's all for sissies. All you macho men and women out there, think of the people who you like and who you are drawn to and ask why. They probably showed you some kindness to you, went out of their way to explain something to you, helped you navigate a difficulty in some way even possibly saved you from some harm. That is altruism. There was also a lot of research in neuroscience, in social psychology, in economics about the roots of happiness. And the funny thing is, is that if you want to be happier, one of the simplest ways to pursue that is to help others. Our efforts to help others, frankly, have a somewhat mixed record of success, but they have an almost perfect record of helping ourselves. To put it another way, one of the selfish pleasures of the world is selfish, is selflessness. So when you feel a little down, go help someone. It's called the helper's high. Contributing to a cause larger than yourself is one of the few things that can elevate our set point for happiness and bring happiness into our lives. 
Skeptics note that we may not be able to solve the problems of global poverty or climate change or injustice or space colonization. Fair enough. But we can help individuals. And that's a legitimate way of changing the world. It's also a way of changing you. I know we think the problems of the world are too vast and we can't make a difference, but I disagree. Let me leave you on this point with a Hawaiian proverb. Now this is utterly hokey and I feel funny in this cap and gown telling you this proverb, but here goes. A little boy is walking along the beach where there are thousands of starfish washed ashore. He's worried for them and tries to save them by throwing them back into the water one by one. He's throwing them back into the water as fast as he can. And a man comes along and looks at the water, looks at the starfish and says, boy, there are zillions of the starfish. You can't possibly make a difference. The boy looks at the man, picks up another starfish and throws it back into the sea and says, it made a big difference to that one. That's what we can do. We may not be able to change every life, but we can change a few. And as you navigate your trade-offs, I hope that you'll try to do your part and be grateful that you can. And now, to all you owls out there, fight on, congratulations, and let's give Rice University a big hoot. <laughs>